We're here today uh, to listen to a personal friend of mine and uh, an inspiration to me in many ways, although he hates flattery. Um, his name's uh, Dr. Dr. Ted Lyon. Dr. Lyon, uh, I, I, I don't have a formal sort of resume for him, but I Good. can tell you a little bit of what I know. Uh, Make it up. Um, uh, I know that, that he, he's a PhD from UCLA, is that right? Um, and his emphasis is Spanish, um, Spanish literature, I would say. Latin American literature. Latin American literature. I came to know him after a, a very traumatic mission experience in Latin America. I was sort of just serendipitously guided into his office when he was sort of uh, having a, a position at the International Studies Center at BYU. Uh, I was looking to learn about international uh, relations, um, but he very quickly invited me to um, enroll in a honors colloquium class that he and Clayton White and Lynn England used to sponsor as part of the honors program at BYU. I believe honors colloquiums have sort of been phased out for the most part, but at the time it was sort of sunstone for credit at BYU. <laughs> you could learn about lots of issues, about reconciling thought and faith. You could talk about evolution. You could talk about reproductive rights. You could talk about... Socialism. You know, socialism, socialism. Marx. Capitalism, whatever. Environmentalism. We read Edward Abbey and Desert Solitaire and all sorts of really cool progressive books. But um, in many ways, I credit this, my association with Dr. Lyon and... Um, in this course is sort of uh, inoculating me and laying a foundation such that when I experienced some other very traumatic uh, crises of faith later on in my life, I was able to sort of deal with them in a way that was constructive for me and my family. So uh, Dr. Lyon also has served as a mission president in Chile, as a um, president of the MTC in Chile, as a personal interpreter to President Holland during his three years in Chile. So one of the things he's here two years two. So one of the things he's here to talk about is the church in Latin America. He's also the son of T. Edgar Lyon, who was the sort of the best buddy with um, Lowell Benyon in the creation of the University of Utah Institute of Religion, that became a precursor to, uh, in my opinion, many of the great minds that founded Dialogue in Sunstone, and sort of a, an attempt to sort of look at fist, history and faith honestly and objectively and reconcile that in some important way. So Dr. Lyon's probably going to talk a bit about his dad. He's probably going to talk a bit about his experiences. He's about to go serve as the temple president, he and his <coughs> wife, uh, of the Chile uh, Santiago Temple. So here's a man who sort of has a bit of a sunstone, I would at least say had a sunstone sympathy, or at least definitely sympathy towards thought and faith, but is also a very devout believing member of the church. And for me, it's hard to find something like that, uh, someone like that, especially who's willing to talk and and um, be filmed uh, and go on the record. So he's going to talk to us about all that and um, and what we might learn from trying to reconcile thought with faith. So without any further ado, I give you Dr. Ted Lyon. Sorry for the that, long introduction. Thank you, John. Um, good to be here. I salute you. I don't really need the Dr. Lyon. That, that seems to be a little formal. Ted Lyon is good enough for me. Uh, the doctor is, is something that happened a long time ago, 40 42 years ago, and we, we can leave it at that. <clears throat> uh, people ask me, I, I'm having to retire now because of the uh, mission call to go to Chile. Uh, I would be 72 when I get back, and, and that would just be a little bit old, uh, and plus I'd lose too much money if I don't get the retirement money while we're in Chile. So it's a, a monetary thing as well. But people ask me, have you seen a change in students at BYU since you've been here? Over the, We've been here since for 35 years with... Five, five of those years in Chile. And I say no, and especially when I see a group like you, you're intellectual, you're thoughtful, you're, you're smart. <clears throat> the, I, I haven't seen any decline in the, the students that I have here. Really can't say that, that, that 30 years ago they were sharper than you. The one thing that I can say is that there is a, an incredible amount of gradism at BYU now that didn't used to exist. You don't know what gradeism is, do you? Uh, requiring high grades. You're, you're smart and you have to have good grades. And I'm not attacking you because I don't think you fit in that category. But if I give an A- minus on a paper, a student is upset and wants to know why, and a B-plus is a bad grade. It didn't used to be that way. I could give C's and D's without 
too much serious problem. So that's been an amazing change that I've seen. You, people come with a very high expectation of getting very high grades. Um, I hope you don't fit into that category. I hope you're learning for learning. Uh, last semester I had Eric Bybee. I suppose some of you know Eric, don't you, in, in class. Where is Eric now? New York. New York. New York. Doing what? Doing special ed with Teach for America. Good. Good for him. Anyway, and, and enjoyed that, that association. John DeLynn was, it was contrary to my counsel and apparently about 22 other of his 24 friends uh, told him to not accept this position as the executive director of Sunstone or suggested they not accept, take it. Uh, and he has, and I admire him very much for that. I hope that your lives from now and five and 10 and 20 years will reflect what, what John's life has reflected. Perhaps some struggle, but at the same time some, some faith that works together. I do really want to talk about T. Edgar Lyon for just a little bit because that's going to get us into the topic that, that we want. <clears throat> When my father died in 1975, Dialogue uh, published a special issue uh, with a black cover, I guess, uh, to, to honor him. Uh, some people tell me that I look like him. Uh, I hope I do. At least we share the hairline anyway and uh, a few other things. Uh, but there's a, a lot of uh, articles in here that relate to him. But I was excited enough about my father that a few years back I, I, I wrote a book um, on him, uh, which I enjoy. But you say, who in the heck is this guy? He's my father, but we'll, we'll talk more about that. Dad was quite well known in the church because he had been at the Institute for a long period of time, the Institute of Salt Lake City, when most of the children of the general authorities went to the University of Utah rather than going to BYU. That's changed now. Children of, of, of general authorities get free tuition at BYU and automatic entrance, and so uh, it, most of them are coming here now. Did you know that? Um, you don't have to uh, even do well in high school. You can get into BYU if you're a child of a general authority. My father had written uh, uh, wrote manuals that were used in the church. This was one that the whole Melchizedek priesthood of the church used called Apostasy to Restoration. It was the last manual in the church that was ever had a name on it of the writer. Have you noticed that? Manuals in the church now do not have names on them. They're written by committees, and they're boring as heck. But... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, this was used throughout the church in 1960, and then some places repeated it in 61 as well. A very meaty, very deep uh, involvement with what the apostasy was, what the original Church of Christ was, and a bit on the restoration as well. So I just bring those uh, to show you. But I want to begin with some stories that will hopefully show you some differences, and perhaps what, how my attitude was formed uh, toward the church. My grandfather was bishop of the Ensign Ward for some 20 years, Ensign Ward in the avenues in Salt Lake. Somewhat of the, many of the general authorities lived in, on the, the, that part of Salt Lake now, where, where now the liberal Democrats live, the, the avenues. But uh, in my grandfather's ward was Heber J. Grant before he was the president of the church and certainly after he was the president of the church. He often attended that ward. Uh, general authorities didn't have to travel because the church wasn't as big in those days. This was in, I'm talking about 1915, 1920. Uh, there weren't even a million members of the church, not even a half million members of the church, and most were concentrated here in, in the Wasatch Front. My father tells a story that when he was a deacon, he was uh, 15. You didn't become a priest in those days until you... Uh, didn't become a teacher until you were 16 in those days. That he was... Um, President Grant was then the president of the church. This would have been in 19, 1919 or 20. And he used to come and sit in the chapel on the, um, on the stand. He would come and stand, but there was only one entrance to the stand, not like our stands now that have two, two entrances. And President Grant would come in and sit right at the far end of the stand. He would walk all the way in, in, down and sit at the far end, so he was sort of in the corner and not uh, too well known. When... Um, <coughs> he was there on one occasion. My father was this uh, older deacon passing the sacrament. They had received a letter. My, my father, my grandfather, the bishop, had received a letter saying that the highest authority on the, uh, who was sitting on the stand should be the first to receive the sacrament. That was something new that hadn't been done before, never been done in the church. This was in 1919. And so. My father was passing the sacrament and, and went up and walked across the, the stand 
right to the corner where President Grant was sitting and passed a sacrament, held the sacrament tray out, and President Grant said, what are you doing? And my father kind of humbled me, you know, said, the sacrament. And he said, go down and start where you're supposed to start. And my father was, you know, a little distraught by the president of the church telling him that he didn't want to take the sacrament first. So Dad went down to the other end and passed the, the sacrament to, to the others first and then uh, and got to President Grant at the end of the row. And uh, was a little in the dilemma as he was passing the, the water then. What should I do? Well, he passed. He started where he had always started. At the, the, as he first came up on the stand and didn't go to the end, got to President Grant at last. As soon as the meeting was over, President Grant called. Uh, he said, David, what's going on? My, my grandfather. And uh, David said, well, we got a letter that said uh, we were supposed to pass the sacrament to the highest authority on the stand. And um, President Grant said, who sent that letter? And my grandfather said, I I'm not sure. He said, well, go get it. So my grandfather went to his office and brought it back, and it was signed by the Quorum of the Twelve. And he showed it to President Grant, and President Grant read it, and he said, those darn Quorum of the Twelve, they're always doing things and not telling me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we couldn't handle that very well in the church today, could we? Because we expect order and we expect much stronger structure than that. The president of the church is going to know about every letter that goes out from the Quorum of the Twelve. They get together and make that decision. But I grew up with that idea uh, as a young man that the church was pretty open and there were pretty things in the, and there were a lot of human beings in the church that, that, that had different personalities. We often talked about them around our table. We were six boys in my family, no girls, sorry, and so there were seven men and, and one woman, my poor little five-foot-three mother, uh, and we almost had to raise our hands to talk at the table because there was so much going on uh, at our dinner table. And um, I got the feeling as they talked about their friends who were general authorities, that, that these were men, human beings, individuals. My mother was on the primary general board of the church and talked about the, the general authorities with whom she worked in very human ways. We've, we've come to extol them uh, often beyond the way they, they want to be extolled, I believe. A second story. 1923, when my father was called on a mission, uh, just at that time, just exactly at the time of June of 1923, the church had issued some new requirements for a temple that people could now start wearing garments that had short sleeves and short uh, uh, legs in them. Up to that point, up to 1923, all garments were down to here and down to here. Did you know that? And they were, of course, one-piece garments as well. And what you did was you simply went to the store, bought yourself a pair of long handles or whatever they were, and then you brought them to the temple, and the temple put the marks in the garments. I hope I'm not embarrassing anyone, and if some of you aren't LDS, you'll learn something about the LDS tonight, I guess. That, that's perfectly fine, too. <clears throat> My grandfather was part of the, of the prayer circle. It was called the John Taylor Prayer Circle, something that doesn't exist in the church today. But back in the 19th century, many of the general authorities, and even John Taylor before he was president, uh, had a group of, of men and women that he gathered around him and they met in the temple once a week like you're doing and they talked about current events and current activities and they introduced them about what, how some, what someone would say about you when you first introduced him no, uh, or, or whatever. No, they, they talked about current activities and, and the, the general authority, John Taylor in this case, would tell him and then, and then his continuation was a man named an elder or president uh, Richards, what was his first name, uh, George F. Richards. Maybe you don't know these people, but they, they were names that are familiar to me. The, George F. Richards was part of the First Presidency. My, father, my grandfather participated in his prayer circle, and, and George Richards, who was also president of the temple, besides being the first counselor the, in the First Presidency, told them about this change with garments that, was, that had been approved and letters had been sent out to uh, bishops and stake presidents. My father, as he's preparing for his mission, got a pair of long handles, uh, underwear, came to the temple, went through the temple thing, and you had to wear a special temple garment in those days, uh, a little different from the, the regular garment. And then after he was through with that temple session, his very first time through, he brought these, this pair of garments that was indeed one piece, but they had short sleeves and short uh, legs. My, my grandmother had cut them off and, and, and sewn them, stitched them up, you know, hemmed them up. 
And the officiator in the temple refused to put them on, refused to, to put them on, on my father. And he said, these are not authorized. There's no such thing as this as you're, you're a heretic or whatever you want to do for, for dressing this way. And he wouldn't do it. My father was, of course, concerned after the temple is a very delicate experience for you who've done it the very first time especially. And um, my father was, was almost in tears. And fortunately, he got his father. And his father quickly went around and had to go outside the temple and go get uh, <clears throat> George F. Richards and bring him in. And, and George F. Richards came in and, and told the temple official, he, he said, we talked about this this morning in the meeting. You know that this, these are now authorized garments. But this man just felt that, but he said, missionaries or special missionaries should, wear, be, should be wearing the, 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 the really authorized garments, you know, the long legs and the long, the long sleeves. And, uh, but George Jeffrey just said, no, he's going on a mission and this is fine. And so he put on his short sleeve and short legged garments. And then they had, these garments had no marks in them. And the um, officiator was, would cut the marks in at the appropriate places, and then you were expected to take them home, and your mother was, was to sew them, sew them up. Did you know this? You're learning stuff about church history. But this officiator was shaking and, and was so angry at my father because he'd been reprimanded by the member of the First Presidency and the president, president of the temple, that as he cut my, my father's marks, he actually cut my father's nipple. <laughs> a, very, a very sore situation, as you might imagine. And, and on the side of it, they had great big shears that they were doing this. And my father, to his dying day, still had a scar right there on, on the side of his nipple. Well, I tell you that. <laughs> why do I tell you that? For, for a second reason. You've chuckled and laughed. The church had a lot of fun and excitement for me. Uh, as my parents told me stories about individuals and, and the participation in, in, in individuals in, in different ways. My father was, after his mission to the Netherlands, was then called by President Grant to be mission president when he was just age 29 to return to the Netherlands. My mother had two children by then and she was pregnant with twins uh, at that time. I, I wasn't one of those. but. Um, they used to tell fun stories, and the President Grant got in, he met, came to my father's farewell, and, and he said, uh, how old are you, Ed? And, and he said, well, I just turned 30 the other day, and, and he said, okay, that's fine. He said, I was a state president when I was 26. He said, the brethren have been getting on my case because you're too young. Well, so we don't hear much about the brethren getting on, on somebody, some other's case, or getting on the case of the president of the church. My father told us those stories. Uh, during the 1930s, when, when my, my father again was uh, on a mission, there were wonderful conflicts in the church between the brethren. This was a time, a very heady time, that President uh, Grant had chosen for his, his counselors and the new apostles that he was calling, had chosen uh, people like Joseph F. Merrill, the first Mormon to ever get a PhD. Uh, James Talmadge, uh, John, Wid John A. Widso. You've heard of these names. Two of them have been presidents of the University of Utah, not of BYU. Um, <clears throat> and and they, it was a heady time. Those men ran into to some conflict with Joseph F. Smith, Joseph Fielding Smith, and some other, some others who were much more in the conservative realm. And it was public, and they talked about their conflicts, and they they, they thought, you don't hear that now in the church, do you? You, you don't hear it. I think there are plenty of strong personalities in, in the Quorum of the Twelve, uh, but they, they've learned to, to mitigate and keep things um, a, little, a little calmer. Well, I'll tell you those stories just to say uh, I grew up with that and it was a fun experience and the church has been uh, considerably fun because of that reason. I really I want to say it, it, it hasn't been so difficult to be uh, a Mormon in my family and to somehow learn to harmonize that thought and, and that faith.